So now we have our little segment on confirmations. So remember, AR confirmations are evidence obtained directly from third parties to validate the AR balance. This is considered very good, very reliable evidence on AR existence, since it is essentially being validated by this independent third party source. And the confirmation process should be controlled by the auditor, which means the auditor should pick the confirmations and the auditor should be mailing the confirmations. So for instance, when you go through your MUS sample selection, right? You do your MUS procedure, it picks all the customers you're supposed to confirm. And if you then are showing the list to your client and your client's like, eh, I really don't want to confirm this customer because last year we tried to, we sent them a confirmation letter and they complained about it. Could you replace them? The answer is no, right? We cannot replace that customer because this would be like the client trying to influence the AR confirmation selection process, right? They should not be influencing that process. That process needs to be random in order for it to be statistically valid in order for like the calculation of the upper misstatement limit under MUS to be valid. That selection needs to be a clean process. So we can't have the client trying to inject their judgments or bias into that process. The auditor also needs to mail the confirmations directly, which I think we have a slide on this later. Yeah, about mailing outside the entity's facilities, but I'll go ahead and talk about it now and then I'll jump back. Um, so essentially the auditor needs to mail these letters directly. So imagine, which this is usually the case for me, I was usually working out of town, right? So it wasn't really easy for me to just go into the office and have the office mail out the confirmation letters. And the confirmation form just looks like a single sheet of paper and it would be stuffed into an envelope with the customer's address and also included is a return envelope addressed directly to the auditor's office. And I think most organizations other than probably big four and maybe second tier firm are still doing these confirmations through snail mail. Now you have to put the postage on your envelope. Okay? And the easiest way to do that generally would be to drop it off at your home office as an auditor, get them to stamp them all for you and send them out for you. But that wasn't quite as easy if like me, you were constantly working an hour or two out of town. So what I would often do would be to go to the company's mail room or mail office, I get them to stamp the envelopes for me. And then when I left that night, I would go prowling around the town to find one of those lovely blue US mail post boxes. And then I'd be stuffing all my confirmations in one of those. Okay. And that Again, the idea is this is adding kind of a, a layer of independence, right? Because if I left all my confirmations with the client and asked them to mail them, that would be an opportunity for them to inject bias or fraud into the process, right? If I just left them with my client, then the client could open them all, fill them all in saying, yes, this balance is correct. Yes, this balance is correct. Yes, this balance is correct. And could mail them all back to me. So that's the risk there. So that's why it's really important to independently um, mail them and also independently receive them back, right? So those letters should be coming back straight to me, the auditor, in my mailbox at the EY building should not be going back to the client site, right? Because if the confirmation letter goes back to the client, again, the client could change something on it or adjust it or do a little whiteout. And we don't want any of that to happen. So if it goes back and it is received by the client, that would kind of invalidate that confirmation. And we'd need to either send it again or do 
some sort of alternate procedures for that one. Going back, this is the second slide under confirmations. When can you omit confirmations? Okay. So if your AR balance is material, obviously, then you can omit them. If RMM for AR existence is very low and you have some other procedure to address the risk, then this could work. Usually RMM for AR existence won't be that low because we do generally have a lot of fraud risks identified for revenue recognition, like we talked about at the very beginning of this chapter. Another reason why you could theoretically not do confirmations if, if, would be if historically they've been really ineffective. Some reasons why they might historically be ineffective could be the type of request, which we'll talk about in a minute. The type of request is totally controlled by the auditor. So that's not really a valid reason not to send them. Like you can't say they've historically been ineffective because they're negative confirmations. So therefore I won't send them because you could easily just change them to be positive. But we'll talk about that more in the next slide. What would be potentially valid reasons to omit them in terms of the reli their reliability would be your prior experience with the client. If you just have worked with them in prior years and you know with the customers you're sending them to, their response rate is just always rock bottom, right? You'll send them three rounds of requests and their response rate is like 10%. So you always wind up having to do alternate procedures anyway for all of them or almost all of them. It could also be the intended respondent and how knowledgeable they are, or confident they are. So for instance, if they have very small customers or their customers are individual, right? So if it's something like healthcare bills, and you're trying to sell, send confirmations to actual regular people like me and you, well, not me and you, because we actually have accounting knowledge, but the average person off the street without accounting knowledge, and you're trying to get that, them to confirm something, they might not understand what they're signing to. They might think you're asking them to pay a bill and they won't want to sign that or respond to it. So in that case, confirmation might just not be the most effective strategy. Another thing to consider is some very, very large corporations, even though they know what confirmations are, they have a policy of non-response. So Home Depot in particular was guilty of this sin. They actually refused to reply to confirmations. And for me on my audits, this was always a point of difficulty because they were always this huge balance sitting in AR, right? Or always like over 5% of the AR balance. Our MUS sampling obviously always picked up their balance, right? Because it was greater than the sampling interval. So it always picks them up. And we always had to send them confirmations and we knew we weren't going to hear a reply, right? We went ahead and sent them anyway because we knew for most of the customers there was a good chance they would reply. But for Home Depot, we knew they have this policy that they will never respond anyway. So for them, it was pointless. But if a company has all customers that know they're not going to respond, then yeah, it's pretty pointless to send the confirmations. This is the slide on positive versus negative confirmations to kind of explain what they are. So a positive confirmation asks customers to indicate whether or not they agree with the AR balance as of the particular balance sheet date you're trying to confirm. And they generally have to like check a box, yes, I agree with this balance, it is correct as of this date, no, I do not agree with this balance, and here is why. And they send it back whether they agree or whether they do not agree. With a negative confirmation, it asks customers to only return the confirmation if they disagree. So only respond if you disagree with the amount. Okay, this sounds all 
fine and dandy, except with a positive confirmation, which wants you to re reply whether you agree or disagree, even when we send three rounds of these letters, we may at best get 50% response rate. So with a negative confirmation, if I send it to you and I'm like, only reply if you disagree and I don't get it back, it could be because you agree or it could be because you're part of my 50% non-responders. And I have no way of telling the difference. Because of this, negative confirmations are generally considered to be not terribly reliable. They're not considered to be a best practice. Personally, in all my years at EY, I never used them and I never heard of anybody using them. And in terms of timing, AR confirmations are something that you can do at interim. And you can particularly do them at interim if controls around revenues are effective, right? If control risk is low around this process, then I am able to confirm AR around interim. The nice thing about being able to push this procedure up to interim is because like I talked about, Generally, we need to send two or three rounds of these requests in order to get a good response rate. And this is the slide that just talked about the fact that they need to be independently mailed to the customers and independently received back, meaning there needs to be kind of a direct line of communication between auditor and customer. So auditor needs to send straight to customer, customer needs to send straight back to auditor. And then we know for each exception indicated on a confirmation, the auditor should examine the difference, determine if it constitutes an exception for audit purposes. And we'll, we know that some of those exceptions wind up going into our MUS calculations for the upper misstatement limit. And that is going to wind up helping us evaluate our audit findings ultimately, right? Because we calculate that upper misstatement limit if we pick, assuming we pick these confirmations through MUS sampling, and we can compare that UML to our tolerable misstatement amount to see if we think the balance is materially misstated or not. I want to really quickly show you an example of some AR confirmations. These are some examples coming from your textbook. Okay, so the one thing I want to point out is accounts receivable confirmations are always sent out on the letterhead of the audit client. Okay, so you'll see here on the upper right is the Earthware symbol, right? Because Earthware is like our, our company that the textbook uses to, for examples. So it's sent out on Earthware letterhead. And it's always gonna be this way. And if you notice, it's saying, dear customers, please look at these statements and confirm whether they're correct or incorrect for our auditors. And it's signed off by the controller of Earthware. So it's basically a request from somebody at the company, such as the controller, and they're saying, hey, please confirm or deny this information for our auditors, and please send this information back directly to our auditors. So that's why a lot of people ask me, how do they know it's okay to share that information with the auditors? Isn't it like confidential information? So this is why they know it's okay, because they're basically getting a letter from the audit client, from the company they owe money to saying, hey, please provide this information to our auditors on the official company letterhead with an official signature from the controller or some other you know, important person. And if you'll notice, it'll say that, it'll provide the auditor's address. And like I said, we usually like to include like a self-addressed envelope to make it easier. Oh yeah, it says that. It says the envelope is enclosed for your reply. It notes, please do not send your payment to the auditors. There's always a line like that. And down here it says, okay, so the balance in AR 
as of December 31st, 2019, should be 12,365. Okay. And this is a filled example of a filled out confirmation. In this case, the person was like, uh, no, our records actually show 12,356. And then the customer signed it off with their date and their name. So if you get one like this back where they have corrected it instead of just saying yes, this would count as an exception. Assuming you were able to validate that what they're saying here is correct, right? We as auditors would investigate this, see if what they are saying here is right or wrong based on the company's records. We would probably compare it ultimately to the cash payment from the customer as well. That's another procedure we like to do. And so we can validate what they're saying. And then this little difference is going to go into our MUS upper misstatement limit calculation. So if we are unable to use confirmations or we don't get the confirmation back, what we go through are these alternative procedures. The most popular alternative procedure, which is what we did definitely on all of my audits, was we looked at subsequent cash receipts, right? And so basically what this means is I look for when the customer actually pays them for this particular item in AR, I can put together a packet that shows me the customer sales order, right? Where the customer actually ordered this thing, a shipping document you know, got shipped off to the customer, an invoice where they billed the customer, and now I see the cash coming in, right, where the customer actually paid for it. So I see the cash or check, I see it traced through in their bank statement, right, and I see the bank reconciliation is getting performed regularly, and so I can, I feel pretty confident, right? I can see the customer ordered, ordered it, they, it was shipped, it was billed, and now the customer paid for it. I'm pretty confident that this amount was valid in AR as of this date, especially if all the, assuming all the timing lines up, right? So this is kind of your number one alternative procedure is looking at those subsequent cash receipts. For most of my audits, because we were typically doing AR confirmations as of an interim date, we were able to see most of the subsequent cash receipts come in before we had to issue our audit opinion. So that's another great reason why you would want to confirm AR as of interim because it gives you more time to see the subsequent cash receipts come in after the fact if people don't reply on the confirmations. If subsequent cash receipts still haven't come in, we would basically get the sales order, shipping documentation, and invoice. So those three, you know, get us somewhat comfortable. It's not great because most of those documents tend to be internal company documents. So there's no real external validation of the sale. And I mean, if you have one or two of those in a sample of like 150, it would be okay, right? If half of your sample is just supported by internal company documents, not so great. Okay, so those are your big alt, alt procedures. And next time we will talk about auditing the purchasing process and AP. So I know you're looking forward to that.